I bought my first stock when I was 11 years old. It was the first quarter of 1942, shortly after Pearl Harbor. If it provides me with annual cash flow, every month I get a check, even if the market goes down and I don't have to sell, if I'm in it for number three, the long term, I should make money in the future. Your most valuable possession is locked away in your brain. I'm talking about your knowledge. Your knowledge is something that can be packaged into some kind of online product. Want to be happy? Build a life, not just a business. Mm -hmm. Living I believe in life. Out here yeah, living I believe in life. Every day we live in I believe in life. What's it like we live in I believe in life? Living life, yes, yeah, so we're grinding it out. Every single day we be grinding it out. What's it like we live in I believe in life? Oh, I believe in life? Oh. Hey, it's Evan Carmichael, and this channel was created to help you overcome the number one challenge that is holding you back, a lack of belief in yourself. You watch these videos because you know there's something more inside you too. You've got Michael Jordan level genius at something. So today let's live your best belief life and learn the five passive income ideas that can make you thousands of dollars per month in extra income. Enjoy. Okay, let's kick it off with idea number one, buy stocks with Warren Buffett. I bought my first stock when I was 11 years old. It was the first quarter of 1942, shortly after Pearl Harbor. I spent $114.75, three, three shares, $114.75. If I put that $114 into the S&P 500 at that time and reinvested the dividends, Think of a figure as to what it might be, would be worth today. Oh, man. Well, it's, okay, you know, but I, I just want right. your audience to think okay. for a second. Okay. The, answer, okay. the answer is about $400,000. Oh. So if I, as a little kid, had taken that 114 bucks, I'd say the shovel and snore or whatever I'd done, $400,000 today, one person's lifetime. That's America. I mean, that isn't me. You know, it, it's, it is the huge tailwind. The American economy gives to any equity investor. Now, the market's gone down many times during that time. People have panicked during that time. Headlines have been terrible. You know, it looked like we were losing the war when we first bought it. But America is a powerful economic machine that since 1776 has worked and it's going to keep working. Now, you don't want to buy to hold for a year. You don't want to buy with the idea that you can sell it in two years or three years necessarily make money. You may, you could lose money that way. But if you buy it for 10, 20, just keep buying the S&P 500 index and forget about all the other nonsense that's being sold to you because I'll guarantee you one thing about the stuff being sold to you, it will carry bigger fees than what I'm talking about. Yes. Yeah. Idea number two, get real estate with cash flow with Grant Cardone. By the way, you should emulate success when investing. And what is the Warren, the Oracle, probably the greatest investor of all time, says, number one, Never. don't lose money. The DLM, mm -hmm. the old down low money. Number two, the old man said, get you some cash flow. I think a lot of you misunderstand that. Warren said, invest for cash flow. He didn't say your second flow should be investing. Mm -hmm. And I'd have this conversation with him if I had dinner with him. And number three, if I could afford to have dinner with him. I can't afford to have dinner with him because as soon as I'd get there, I'd be like, this is going to end and that would cause me a lot of problems. <laughs> okay, number three, what do we say here? Never depend. No, oh. long term. Hmm. Long term. you got to be in this deal for long term. This is what led me, these three rules by the old man, Warren Buffett, is what led me to investing in real estate. So every Monday I come to you to advise you, your family, wherever you are, whether you're you got a job right now and you're making 60, 70,000 bucks a year, or maybe you're making 600 grand a year or $6 million a year, and you're like, how do I get out of this thing that I'm in and start creating other flows for myself, okay? Number one, don't lose money. Number two, cash flow. Number three, long-term, be a long-term investor. When I buy a piece of property for Four million dollars, okay? I just want to test these three criteria. Captain Ryan's with us, Real Estate Ryan. Good to be here. And I put one million dollars down. Mm -hmm. How can I possibly lose my one million dollars? 
okay? I financed $3 million. By the way, the old man would like me financing this deal long term, 10 years, 10 years of debt on this, from a good bank that believes in my property that's actually a partner with me, okay? I'm using the bank like I would Warren Buffett's money as a partner. So when I, put, when I buy a $4 million real asset that produces cash flow, and I put $1 million down, what has to happen, ladies and gentlemen, my friends on the Instagram, the YouTube, the Facebook, and the iTunes that are listening to me because mm -hmm. you're like Stevie Wonder, you can't see. Mm. How do I lose my money? You tell me how I lose my money. I'm buying in Miami, Orlando, Tampa, Houston, Texas. A lot of job growth. I know the market that I'm... I know the market that I'm buying in, okay? I have tenants in the building. How do I lose my $1 million? Because that's what we're talking about here. How would I lose $1 million? One. Two, if it provides cash flow every month, 4%, 5%, 6%, 8%, 10%, if it provides me with annual cash flow, every month I get a check, even if the market goes down and I don't have to sell, if I'm in it for number three, the long term, I should make money in the future. It's just when. When do I make money? So that's what led me. So I started studying because I love real estate. I'm like, I need to buy real estate that cash flows, not real estate. What real estate is going to cash flow today, next month, next year, and 10 years from now? Apartments. What do you think? Since 1945, the rents in America have gone up since World War II. Look at how many recessions we've had between 1945 and 2017. That's 70 years. And rents did this the whole time. That's a graph. Ding, 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 ding. You don't stop, you don't stop 50 year trends. You don't stop 50 year trends. Okay, so leads me down to what? Apartments, right? Leads me apartments and leads me at mobile homes, leads me at storage. I need to focus on one of these because I'm a focused person. I'm not gonna try to do everything. <clears throat> so I started looking at apartments. Can I understand apartments? First thing I ever bought was a single family home. I put a renter in it, if you know my story. I put a renter in it, renter moved out. I was like, oh, shit, that doesn't work. Sold it, got rid of it. I said, I'll never do that again. What did I do wrong? One door, one door. Okay, if you're taking notes and you wanna go do this yourself, I'll help you do it yourself, by the way. You don't have to invest with me. Okay, never buy one door, ever. You wanna buy lots of doors. The more doors, the better. The, more, the, the number of units, the most important number in real estate, the single most important number, and Brandon will talk to you about this tomorrow, in any business, the most important number is the number of, in this case, units. In a business, it would be volume. It would be, it would be, it, it could be square footage. It's gonna be, huh? It would be, how many times can you multiply that unit times? And the bigger you can get that number, that's why Netflix works, Facebook works, Amazon works, because these people are trying to scale that. Hey man. Evan, how you doing buddy? Good, how are you? You got a book coming out, don't you? Uh, you just came out. Where can people get it? Get it on uh, Amazon, easiest spot, built to serve, right there. Let's go, man. If you guys don't know Evan, follow Evan Carmichael. He's got a new book out, Build a Serve. Go grab it today at Amazon. There's a good dude right here. Idea number three, get into crypto with Chamath Palihapitiya. Why are you excited about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies? <laughs> well, I, I, I mean, I think, look, if you go back to 18 whatever, um, you know, we are in a, a world where uh, the dollar just fundamentally debases naturally as you print more money, like literally by printing more, um, we actually make every single existing one worth slightly less. So you eventually in a digital economy will have to come and reckon with that. Um, at the same time, the way that people deal with the financialization of all of the things that have happened in the economy is that they try to hedge. And the problem with all of that is that it actually creates very interlinked dependencies. So it's a setup where on the one hand, the core underlying asset that people use to price risk is, you know, uh, it degrades in value by, you know, four, five, six percent in a good year. And in a year like last year, 15, 20 percent, because we printed literally so much money on the one hand. And on the other hand, you have fundamental correlated risk with everything. So if you want 
some instrument of value to underpin a digital economy, it will have to be a cryptocurrency. And the more distributed it is, uh, the less manipulated it can be. Um, and so that's why crypto and, and frankly, it's why it's why um, it's why Bitcoin. Um, and then, you know, if you then move past that and say, OK, how can we do functional things with all of that? Then you're probably in a world of uh, DeFi and Ethereum and, you know, that stuff. Idea number four, sell digital products with Mark Tilbury selling digital products and was inspired by a meeting that I had with Richard Branson. You know, the guy that owns Virgin. I discussed with Richard how the world was changing and how information was becoming more valuable than gold. What an age to live in. Just think about some of the top companies. Airbnb has no real estate. Facebook creates no content and Netflix isn't even a TV channel. The internet has truly changed the game. This simple meeting really had a dramatic impact on my life and my business. As I started to be more open to new online opportunities, I started selling a digital flight simulation program. We only had to create that once and then we can sell it hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times passively in my sleep. It was perfect. Here are some ideas that you can try. Create an app. One of the ones were the in-app purchases. You've probably seen a lot of YouTubers promoting Raid Shadow Legends. I mean, this would be a perfect brand deal if I had one. You can upgrade your armor in that, your weapons, you name it. There's an upgrade for it for a little bit of money. And that money is going straight into the app developer's pocket because guess what? He doesn't have to go out and make a sword. He doesn't have to go out and make a new suit of armor for you. It's just a little bit of code and he can sell that simple line of code over and over again. And how about this? Not everyone has the time to build up a social media account. So if you don't have a lot of money, but you do have a lot of time, you can create a theme page on Instagram, for example, and then sell that on for a profit to whoever wants to buy it. The most important thing to remember is your most valuable possession is locked away in your brain. I'm talking about your knowledge. Your knowledge is something that can be packaged into some kind of online product and sell that many, many, many times over. And idea number five, the last one before some very special bonus clips is collect valuable pieces with Kevin O'Leary. These are the most coveted watches in the world. I'm going to show you six watches that when put together are the most desirable collection you can have today. And they're not all the most expensive watches. They're just the hardest to get. And the reason I'm pointing these out in a collection, I like to throw a little French in there, is that when you acquire these pieces one at a time, they have tremendous aftermarket value. So let's start our journey off on the right foot. We're gonna be working with three different brands. Now there are lots of brands of watches and I'm not saying these are the only three brands you're gonna be dealing with, but when you start, start to talk about the pillar of a collection, you're going to have to have watches from each of these three. Number one, Rolex, of course. It's probably one of the best known brands of watches in the world. And there are many pieces within the Rolex family that are extremely coveted and not the most expensive. We're gonna learn about that today. Number two, Patek Philippe. Now, this is a very storied Swiss watch company, no question about it. They talk about the heritage of the watches. There are certain pieces within the Patek Philippe collection which are extremely hard to get, but very valuable and really part of anybody's collection even though it may take time to get them. And lastly, Adimar Piquet. You know, AEP, as it's affectionately known by its fans, they have remarkable watches. They probably only make rumored about 40,000 watches a year. The Royal Oak is the most famous of them all. And it certainly took me a long time to get my first 5711, 10 years, but it was worth the wait. I'll tell you why. Let's look at the economics that's driving this process. The purchase price of this watch is basically $31,373.51. Yes, it's a lot, but is it a good investment? Oh yes, my friends. What are these trading for right now in the open market? $72,295. That's 123% appreciation. yippee ya yo ka yay That's what I'm talking about. So you can build your collection and you can also at the same time make great investments. The Pepsi has become desired by collectors because of its beauty. 
It's got a blue and a red ceramic. The new version comes with the Julian bracelet. I have modified mine to be a red because I love that for when I'm shooting television. But the Pepsi is a GMT and very hard to get, but not that expensive. The retail price of this watch, let's look at it in some detail here. Let's have a close up of the Pepsi, okay? Here you go. It's just fun to look at this beautiful dial. I think the red band on this looks absolutely spectacular, no question about it. And when it comes into play, and look at how that face works so beautifully with that blue and red ceramic dial, absolutely gorgeous. But I'll tell you what's really gorgeous, look at the value in the aftermarket of this watch. The price at retail is 9855 if you go to your app, Chrono24, plug this watch in, it's now last trade globally at 18832 That's right, kiddies, a 91% increase in value. Oh, just a moment, that brings a tear to my eye. So we're building our collection, and in each case getting between 40, 50, 60, 70, 80% appreciation if we're willing to wait. And that's the whole point of this journey. You have to realize that watch collecting is a journey. It is not a destination. It's going to take a very long time to find these pieces, but just like the fish swimming in the tank behind us, you have to be at peace collecting. From the beauty on your wrist to what they've done in your bank account as an investment, and that's what I'm all about. I love to marry beauty with returns. Now I've got a really special bonus clip that I think you're gonna enjoy, but before that, it's time for the question of the day. I wanna know what was your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action for the next week? The science says that when you just watch a video, you get motivated, you get inspired, you have a 35% chance of following through on your goals. 35%, that's not enough, that's not enough just to get motivated. Believe Nation, we're here, you're here. The today matters, you're an action taker. When you commit to a plan of action of when and how you're gonna follow through, when you write it down, you have a 91% chance of following through. And when you commit publicly to somebody else, it jumps to 95% chance. From 30 something percent to 95% chance of you following through. Believe Nation, we need to make this happen. So question of the day, your single biggest takeaway from this video and your plan of action specific for the next week. Put it down in the comments below and I'm gonna show on screen sometime next week to celebrate using affiliate programs. So this is basically where you are not creating a new product or service, you are representing somebody else's product or service, and every time you sell it, you take a cut, you get a commission for doing it. The best ones to do this with are, are products and services that you actually use. As an example, in making these YouTube videos, if I was using a specific phone or camera or microphone or gear, I could say, hey, I use this gear myself. This is what I use on a regular basis for you guys. If you wanna start your own YouTube channel and you wanna use the same gear, go check out this link on Amazon. And anytime I would do that, I would take a cut. I'd get a commission for making that sale. I'm not a huge fan of affiliate programs. I don't need it, I don't use it in my business, but it's a great way to be able to add extra streams of income without having to do a whole lot of extra work because it fits in nicely, and this is always the key, it fits in nicely with your current business. If you're trying to do affiliate marketing that is totally different than what you're currently selling to your, your customers in this business line, and then you have another company out here, another company out here, and you've got all these different mini businesses, that's really hard because you're never actually focusing on one company and you, you end up doing everything in a really mediocre way. And so the best way to do this is to have one core business, one core focus of what you're trying to do, and then all of this can plug in. So by making YouTube videos, I use these products. Here you go, boom. I could do it in a dance world, right? Here are the dance shoes that I use. If you wanna go buy the same dance shoes, then here you go. And I end up getting a cut potentially from that. It's easy because you don't have to worry about manufacturing, you don't have to worry about shipping, you don't have to worry about returns, you don't have to worry about customer service. All you're doing is passing along the word to say, I use these guys, they're really good, I think you should too. And you get a cut every single time those deals happen. The most lucrative ones are when it's some recurring service and then you take an ongoing cut. So it's not just a one-time sale, but it's ongoing. So email newsletters are an example. I use Aweber for my email newsletters. If I sent out a affiliate code to you guys and say, hey, I use Aweber, I've been using it for, for a decade. You guys should use Aweber too. Here's an affiliate link. If you clicked on that and you sign up for Aweber, Anytime you made a payment, which is usually every month, then I would get a cut. That's part of their program. It's like it's a cut for life. 
not just a cut off the first time sale. And so if you want to take affiliate marketing seriously, you want to turn that into something that can be you know, massively revenue generating for you, I would be looking at ones where you get an ongoing payment and not just the one-time fee. But more important than that is make sure that you actually use the product, that you actually find it valuable, that you would recommend it to your mother or your wife or your husband or your kids to use because it is just that helpful. Income, expense, asset, liability. So debt falls in here. So if you, let's say I'm gonna buy, and everybody says I'm gonna buy a house, and everybody says my house is an asset. That's not true. Your house is a liability. I don't care if you have no debt on it or not. A house is a liability. Same as if you have a car. A car is a liability. And the reason for that is, as we talked about earlier, the six words that are basics of financial education, financial intelligence, income expense, asset liability, and the two other words are cash flow. So when you look at the average person, they have a job, money comes in here, they pay for their house, and the money goes to a bank through a mortgage. So it's not an asset because the cash is flying, flowing out. So it's a liability. So the definition of liability, does it take money from your pocket? And for an asset, does it put money in your pocket? So when I have a rental property here, it puts money in my pocket. So if I live in the house, it's a liability because even if I have no debt on it, I still have taxes, depreciation, repairs, and upkeep, insurance, and all this. When I rent a property, I've done a good job buying it and structuring it. Every month, it sends me money. So I started off when I was 25, I had a little one bedroom condo. And it put 25 bucks in my pocket. It was a start. So this was good debt. You see, I, this, the debt also went out and paid, but it also put $25 in my pocket. So net, net, I was making money from my little house. So today, my wife and I own 6,500 of them. And every month, 6,500 houses put money in my pocket. My, my people who live in them love me and all this because they have a place to live. But all of this comes from debt. So we don't, oh, we have, they're 100% finance here. It's all debt. So this is good debt. And what makes it good debt is, are the two most important words, cash flow. What most people do is they have student loan debt, SL, and that debt is going out this way. You know, it doesn't put any money in your pocket. You can say, well, I have a job. Well, that's still you working for it. So I don't work for any of this money here. I do this job once, set the deal up. Every year I add more and more and more of it. I'm borrowing money from here. It's coming here and going this way. So the debt is putting money in my pocket and bad debt is taking money from my pocket. So the the problem is, if you're gonna use debt, you've gotta be much smarter than this person here. You've got to be very, very smart. That's why I took real estate classes when I was 25, and I've never stopped taking real estate classes. Because you buy a piece of real estate and you make a mistake, this turns into a liability. Yeah, this, if, I'm, if, if I get the renter leaves the place, this goes here that fast. And the cash flows that way. It's going out of my pocket. So it has nothing to do with real estate, it has nothing to do with the car, that there was student loan. It has to do with these two words here. So good debt, again, is debt when I borrow for this and it puts money in my pocket. If I had a car and I borrowed money from it and somebody rented for me as an Uber driver or something and it put money in my pocket, it would be an asset. My wife and I have a boat and you know, most boats lose money, but our boat makes money because it's in a charter. You know, people rent my boat all the time. 
So it has nothing to do whether it's a boat, student loan debt, a house, a car, or whatever. It has to do with these two words here. So this time I went back, uh, actually to 1942, when I bought my first stock as an illustration of all the things that have happened since 1942. We've had, we've had uh, 14 presidents, seven Republicans, seven Democrats. We've had, we've had world wars, we had 9-11, we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, we have, a, we have all kinds of things. The best single thing you could have done on March 11th, 1942, when I bought my first stock, was just buy an index fund and, 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 and never look at a headline, never think about stocks anymore, just like you would do if you bought a farm. You just buy the farm and let the, let the tenant farmer run it for you. And I pointed out that if you'd put $10,000 in an index fund that reinvested dividends, and I paused for a moment to let the audience try and guess how much it amount to, and it would come to $51 million now. And the only thing you had to really believe in then is that America would win the war and that America would progress as it has ever since 1776 and that American business, if America moved forward, American business would move forward. You didn't have to worry about what stock to buy. You didn't have to worry what day to get in and out. You didn't, you didn't know the Federal Reserve would exist, <laughs> whatever it might be. And uh, uh, America works. The only thing that matters is free cash flow. That's it. There is no other reason to own a stock. And with that philosophy, it brings you into a place where you focus on a company's ability to generate incremental cash flow. Because just owning a dividend paying stock is not good enough. Because, you know, let's say we find a stock today that's paying a 3% dividend yield, and tomorrow, because its forecast for sales get cut in half, the stock drops by 50%. Now it's yielding 6%. I don't want to own that stock either. So my tests in this index that I've you know, created with FTSE Russell looks at the balance sheet. Every year we test to make sure that the company is viable in its ability to generate cash. This is extremely conservative investing. This is for the long haul. These tools are not for, as you're suggesting, for spicy, you know, the hot stock du jour. I've done that, I've been there. You know, let the young legs do that. I have zero interest in that. I don't care what the hot new stock is. You know, when, when, a, when a company comes public, I won't own it either. It's got to prove to me over multiple years that it can continue to generate cash before it even fits into what I'm doing. So I'm really boring and I like it that way. We're talking about r real money here, the stuff that you need to preserve. You know, when I think about my family trust, I can't afford to mess around with that. In my world, you never touch your principal. You adjust your spending habits, your gifts to charities, your use of capital based on how much you can generate from your portfolio. I view my portfolio and my trust and my positions as a chicken on a spit dripping cash. Everything has to generate yield, whether it's a fixed income position or an equity. It has to, it, the only reason it can be in my world is it's generating capital back to me. I take that, I disperse it. The family lives off that, the charities I've committed to. Um, so I'm always looking for a company that can help me with my problem of generating more yield. Everything that, I mean, I can't even imagine buying a stock that doesn't pay a dividend. Why would you do that? What would be the reason you would do that? I, I don't get it. So to me, that means about 28% of the, of the market, to me, is just speculation. A stock that doesn't pay a dividend is a speculation. It's not an investment. Passive income is the support mechanism. This is why you guys need this, right? Because if, if you're active working and getting money and you don't have this, ding, 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 healthy, unhealthy, hurt, unhurt, business stops or doesn't stop, technology gets the rest. So what you need to do is you guys, you, you and your wife or you and your husband need to sit down and figure out Hey, how do we get passive income? How do we do that? You could go buy AT&T stock. If you bought AT&T stock, symbol is T, 10 years ago, it was 40, I think it was $42 a share. Okay, today it's $34 a share. You would have lost $8, but here's what you would have earned. You would have earned, you would have earned a 6% dividend. Let's say you put $10,000 in it. This is passive income. You took the money from the active income after taxes, you invested 10 grand, you bought AT&T stock in 2007, 
2008, 2009, world came to an end. The stock went from $42 to $34. I think it's 34 bucks today. But you were paid a 6% dividend, okay? 6% on $10,000 is $600. For 10 years, you were paid $600 every quarter, March, June, I think September and December, you get a check for 150 bucks. Every quarter, every three months, they send you what's called a dividend. This is passive income. You guys with me? 6% on the 10,000 is 600 bucks a year. So watch, even though the stock went down, okay, 10 years, let's say this is 10 years, this is $42 or $45, and now it went down to 33 or 34, whatever the number is, somewhere in here. Even though the stock went down, watch what happened. The dividend, the passive portion of the investment, paid you back $6,000 out of your $10,000. Now, if you sell it today, you're going to be selling it for a third less than you paid for it, seven grand. But you were paid back six grand, so you still made money. Right now, the, the fact is, you don't really care about the loss. Listen to what I'm saying right here. You pay 10,000. It's only worth seven grand today. You really don't care about the loss because you made the loss when you bought it. The loss incurred when you bought it. What, what do I mean by that? You took six, seven, ten thousand dollars and you gave it to an institution. It bought a piece of paper, no more valuable than this piece of paper, by the way. The piece of paper was locked away. In fact, it's so valueless to you, 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 you can't even find that piece of paper. It's literally one little piece of paper that says you own $10,000 worth of AT&T stock. Cross your fingers and hope, pray to God that it's gonna be all right. Every quarter, every three months, you got a check. They sent you a little check, 150 bucks, 150 bucks, 150 bucks. That little check over 10 years paid you back $6,000, okay? You lost your money when you bought the check, when you bought the paper. When you bought the AT&T stock, what do I mean you lost the money? You lost it because you gave them money for this piece of paper, right? What you want to do right here is you want to stop buying things that go down or up. You want to start buying things that stay stable and pay you a big dividend with the hope of a big bang. What you need to do is this, okay? If I'm making 100 grand a year, oops, if I make, and let's take a caller. If I make $100,000 a year, what your goal should be is, hey, I need to match that with $100,000 worth of passive income. I want them both. Ultimately, what I want is more passive income than active income. Okay, I'm just going to tell you guys a little sneaky story. This year, I will probably make this much money a month off passive income. The lowest taxed income, I work the least for it, okay? It continues on after I die. Nothing can stop it, okay? And I'm not having to push and pound, right? Nothing can stop this. So the, the key ingredients to, to, to passive income, one, you wanna match your, your active, and number two, you wanna invest in things that will not, not go down in value. Number two, they don't go down in value, they stay. That means you need real things, not pieces of paper. You don't want a piece of paper, you want a real asset Second qualifier, the third qualifier, they should never be disrupted. Only invest in companies that cannot be disrupted. Why did AT&T stock go from 45 to 32? Because it's in telecom and it's being disrupted. You understand? Facebook will be disrupted, trust me. YouTube will be disrupted. Google will be disrupted over time. Apple will be disrupted. There will be a time when we don't have this phone. All you gotta do is go back and watch Movies and TV shows that were made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Look at all the things in the scenes that aren't around anymore, okay? That telephone that your mama used to do the rotary, it won't be around anymore. If you look at the videos that I make, most of them are evergreen. It's called evergreen content because whether you watch it today or whether you watch it in five years, the content is still relevant and valuable. I love creating things that are of timeless value because it's valuable to somebody today, and it's also valuable to somebody next year, and in five years, and in 10 years, and 20 years. You know, when we're showing clips of Martin Luther King or Napoleon Hill, the video footage may be decades old, but it's still relevant and helpful and valuable to me and to you today. And so 
how that helps you make money while you sleep is you spend a lot of time making something and it sucks when it only lasts for a day or a week or a month and then it shoots to zero. So if you're doing something around the trend, if you're covering the election right now, it might be really hot right now because everybody's talking about it, but nobody's gonna care once the election is over. Nobody's gonna look back on a lot of the content that was created. And I hate that kind of business because I wanna make something and have it live forever and I want people to pay attention to it forever. And so all the work that I do, every new thing that I add into my business adds multiple streams for me down the future. And so it continues to build and build and build and build. And so I try to create things that last and if you wanna make money while you sleep, having that kind of focus, something that is still relevant and valuable in five, 10, 20 years is super helpful to you making money while you sleep. What do you think most entrepreneurs do wrong? Most entrepreneurs, they make money and they don't reinvest it. You know, they blow it and then, you know, economy is cyclical when the business has a, you know, dip and they've bought all these Ferraris, cars, Lamborghinis, and they didn't reinvest and they'll, you know, hit a, hit a bad spot in financial spot. So financially you weren't cashing out, you know, when you started, and we'll get into when you started making yeah. good money in real estate, but you didn't start cashing out and buying luxury stuff right away, right? Or no. did you kind of, were you patient with it or what was your process? Yeah, my process was with my investment was always reinvest the money. It's like, you know, buying a cow, you don't sell the cow, you sell the milk. And right. even when you sell the milk, you take part of the profit and invest it in a second cow. Yeah. You know? <laughs> and only with that thirty percent of it, whatever it may be, you go buy, you know, iPad, iPhone, whatever you have. So my mentality was always reinvest, 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 you know. Don't spend the principal, reinvest the cash flow, you know. And that's how I've amassed all this real estate. And I told myself, I said, hey, I'm gonna buy a Bugatti when I can buy ten of them cash. You know, but most entrepreneurs, they go ahead and finance it and they start taking a lot, of, a lot of loans in. And then when the business slows down, it's, you know, overwhelming. And, you know, they, they start having uh, financial difficulty and some of them don't survive, you know. But to me, whatever your trade is, make the money, invest in real estate and be patient. And every time recessions comes, keep buying. The thing about garage sale that really turns me on is the thrill of the hunt because it's the place where you can really score a huge box of toys for three bucks or three hundred. How many can I hear me carry on you? Uh, you're like four hundred. Don't need that much. Fifteen bucks, thirty bucks. It's like I don't know. Usually, usually, truly, you only need about a hundred bucks. This could be decent. It looks a little too new, but we're about to f-ing strike. There's striking to be done here. How much are the stuffed animals? Oh, 50 cents. 50 cents. <laughs> Good. <laughs> SpongeBob, maybe? Oh, it's that. Sam's got color. The lady is who kind of got color. How much is this? All right, stuffed animals continue to be my score. 50 cents a pop, Dumbo, Disney store. Snuffle up, I guess. Bang, Olaf, what? And this one's gonna be a beast. The FAO Schwartz, FAO Schwartz giraffe. So we just looked it up, the uh, the Jeffrey uh, giraffe, Toys R Us, FAO Schwartz combo, 30 bucks. Love to. Paid 50 cents. I don't know what to say, after eBay fees, it's just like a quick 20 bucks. It's just a lot of people not making 20 bucks an hour. I mean, just one of the things. Wait till I look up the snuffle of this. Thank you so much. You gotta look. This is pretty exciting to me. Vintage Lego thing never opened. Uh, oh, 2003. Jesus, I'm getting old. But it's still 15 years old. I'm excited to open this up. This was a huge score. I already looked it up. Paid three. They wanted five. Paid three uh, for these Spider-Man skates in package. Never opened as well. Or opened. Um, pretty excited about it. Oh, don't worry. <laughs> That's so awesome, by her. All right, let's go. <laughs> color. Yeah, she goes. At least go around the corner. Don't kill me. <laughs> so good. So good. Lego four zero nine eight. 
25 bucks. Give it to me, Lulu. All right, pay two bucks for this. All right, cool. So some Macy's snow globes in there. And they are better than I think I thought. You gonna go back and buy them? Yep. Would you do 10 if I bought three? Yeah. Okay. Do you have a bag? I do have a bag. Awesome. This is exciting. We just bought three snow globes for 10 bucks. And I'm fired up. I'm fired up, my guy. I'm fired up. All right, how do you feel? Feeling really good now. <laughs> Starting to get hot. Getting some stuff now. Well over the $200 range, maybe a little bit more even. Feel much better. $200 is a lot. A whole lot. When you need it, I like to. It's probably more, we'll see. What? It says two. Would you take a dollar for this? Sure. Thanks. All right, picked up this scary bear for a dollar called For Real from Tiger 2004. Let's see what it's worth. 20 bucks all day. Big score. All day, 20 bucks. <laughs> you shot, dude. <laughs> Who, me? Could I get more excited about this than like... Than <laughs> To get an angle. Oh. I can't better. Just picked up two jerseys for two bucks a piece. Kevin Durant, Seattle Supersonics jersey, pretty rare, two bucks. Garnett, really nice one actually, stitched, Celtics, two bucks each, we'll see. 64 bucks for the Durant, I mean. Pay two dollars. Pay two bucks, you saw my, there was a little bit of like shitty stains on it, I can clean that off, just crazy. If I was and really doing right, this, right to stay I'd, make, I'd make a thousand a week, easy, and if you like, on just Saturday. Yeah. Just working Saturday. Yeah, I get that. So, ugh. I mean, I genuinely think Goodwill, eBay, buying bulk on eBay, selling on Amazon, like, I just think this is the $100,000 a year thing for so many people making thirty to 60000 a year. I feel phenomenal. This is the big final score. This is about 100 bucks minimum. And now I know about Cherished Teddies. Now I'm a Cherished Teddies player. And every time you become more of a player of a new thing, look, this is very simple. Spent 40, 50, uh, 20, 40 bucks, 50 bucks, easily now into the five or $600 range of resale. I just wish so many of you would do this. It's four, five, 600 bucks every weekend. It's now 1147, so we're four hours in. Little gas money, I get it, but like net net, two, three, 400 bucks every weekend. And if you don't want to be like tedious because now you got to post in all this, cool, just throw up this. Huge collection of cherished teddies, 80 bucks, boom, quick little, you know, 60 bucks here. Shit adds up when you got groceries, when you got bills, when you got college loans, when you got rent, people sitting around dwelling. 85, 90% of this country working, you know, minimum wages, low incomes, it just matters. Teaching people how to fish, flip life, it's real. If you want to learn how to make more money while you're sleeping, check out the video right there next to me. I think you'll love it. Continue to believe, and I'll see you there. So in general, I try to actually stay away from these kinds of topics because I think a lot of people who are interested in these things are kind of lazy, are looking for quick ways to be able to make, make more money.